are almost on. Okay. Hey, everybody. This is Al. We're here at the Kelly Writers House at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And I just want to say that the thread, the Modpo thread called Struggle Street Form and Content, a week ago I praised people who are struggling on Struggle Street. Struggle Street. Uh, it's the big issue in Modpo, form and content. Now there are more than 2,000 views and 241 posts. And I have to say that I like our new sleek, modified site slash platform a lot. One thing that's hard, several things that are hard, but one thing that's hard about it is that big threads are difficult to manage. It's gonna get better. We're working with the Coursera engineers on engineering. We don't do any engineering. The engineers engineer at our request and others' request to make the navigation of long threads better. But that has 241 posts. That says something. Those are pioneers on Struggle Street. I highly recommend it. The quality of the essays that have been, Jason, can you get that door? Yeah. The quality of the essays that have been submitted, essay assignment number one, have been really, really high. The, the CTAs and others have noticed how amazing it is. If someone knows why, why in 2016 the quality, as much as we can tell, has just gone way up. What is it? Is it that there are a lot of, I don't know. Lily, why are the essays so good? Um. I think we do, I think we model the format in our like discussions and uh, you know, like in the tape discussions and also in how uh, Modpo participants and TAs and CTAs like respond to one another on the forums. Yeah, but, that, but it's higher than it's ever been. That's the, anyway, who knows, but I'm so glad the, 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 the essays and the peer reviews are just great. So please do peer reviews. If you're watching this webcast, you are in the, you know, you're in the active group. People who tune into our webcasts live are into it, right? Hello, T in Manila. Hello, right? She's in. And so, you know, you're, these, are, these are really dedicated people. These are the people who do peer reviews. So I'm able to say to people live tonight, do the peer reviews. Tonight, I'm going to introduce my friends, but tonight we're talking about the rise of modernism, we're talking about imagism. HD's C Rose and C Poppies, Ezra Pounds in a Station at the Metro and the Encounter, Wallace Stevens' 13 Ways of Looking at a Blackbird, and uh, a bunch of Williams' Lines Between Walls. This is just to say the wed, uh, the wed wheelbarrow, the red wheelbarrow, Portrait of a Lady, The Rose is Obsolete, and we threw in a urinal turned upside down and signed by Marcel Duchamp and nude descending a staircase of painting. That's what we're talking about tonight. That is what we're talking about tonight. So, Davey, hello. Hi, Al. How are you? I'm good, how are you? Are you gonna talk fast tonight? Talk really slowly, Al. No, no, I think you should talk fast because I really like it. Gets That's my natural habit, yeah. <laughs> All right, Emily Harnett, get close to the mic. Come on, Emily. By the way, I know, how, I mean, how many years do we have to do this? Emily Harnett is here, Lily Applebaum is hello. here. Allie Castleman coming to us from New York, and I don't think she's at work tonight. Are you not at work? Turn your I'm mute not, off. I'm not at work. I'm at home. Where are you? At home in Brooklyn. All right, BK. And Amaris Kuchansky, hello. Hello. Hi, and Dave Poplar is here. Hi, Dave. Good evening. Hey, so I want to make a few announcements, and then we're going to get started. Phone calls, 215-573-9752, 215-573. 9752. We have Cliff, who's here all the way from Los Angeles. Now, Cliff should be sitting in his robes behind a bench. Do you do robes? Yes. yes. He is a judge. He is a judge. He is also the dad. He's a proud Penn parent. And he's here from LA. He's a longtime Modpo guy, and we're just happy to have him here. Mandana came from New York. Yay. Yeah. Hi, Mandana. Hi, there, there it is. Yeah, we're gonna, there's a mic, there's a microphone in your future, so get ready for that. Anyway, we're so happy that Mandana's here. We have Adelaide here, we have Emily's here, we have Danny's here, hi Danny. And this is a chance for me to say something that I haven't told Modpo people yet, which is that 
The students in my class, English 88, which is the origin of ModPo, I've been teaching it for 30 years in this room, not 30 years in this room, but recently in this room, but for 30 years overall, those people are in ModPo. For the first time, the students in 88 are meeting me and Lily and Emily and Anna and others, and Davey and others, twice a week in this room, but they're also doing the ModPo work, and you're gonna see them if they identify themselves in the forums, and we're just so glad, and we have three of those students here tonight. We also have Anna, who's on the phone. Hello, Anna. Hello, hello. We also have Jason, who's here, who's amazing, always. And we have the, the two guys who set this up, Chris Martin and Zach Cardiner, have done something special tonight. It's hard enough setting it up. It's hard enough setting it up. Um, regularly, but what they've done is they have decided to simulate what they call on-the-road equipment because next week Lily and I and Chris and Zach are flying to the Bay Area and we are going to hang out in the Bay Area and we're doing a live webcast. Next week's live webcast is not on Wednesday, it's on Thursday at 6 p.m. California time. 6 p.m. California time from Coursera's offices, their building. And inside that building, we will be doing a live webcast. We are going to show our Coursera colleagues what a truly interactive, massive, open, online, free, non-credit, interactive, online course looks like from inside Coursera's headquarters at 6 p.m. And these guys, these, anybody old enough to remember what it was like when the people in Houston and Kennedy Space Center together tried to figure out how we're gonna get Apollo 13 to the moon. What they did is, in Apollo 10, is they sent up all the little spidery wires and things to simulate a moon landing in Earth orbit. And then Apollo, uh, I'm messing it up, Apollo 12 didn't work out so well, right? That's the one, or is it 13? No, I'm sorry, it's nine. And 10, and 11 landed, but 9 and 10 were these like experiments. Anyway, this is a terrible analogy. What these guys do, they remind me of the NASA guys from the 60s with a lot of wires. What they do is, tonight, they're simulating this limited amount of equipment. We're actually simulating the on-the-road equipment. They're going to have to schlep all this stuff across country, and we have to actually pack it into little bits. So how's it going, guys? Are we, is, it, is it breaking down yet? <laughs> so far, we're good. All right. Okay, so in San Francisco next week, Thursday at 6 p.m., uh, and then Saturday night in San Francisco itself, the Mountain View, I the Coursera office is in Mountain View, California, in Silicon Valley, 6 p.m. Thursday. Saturday at the San Francisco Center for the Book on October 8th at 6 p.m. also will be there. Okay, so for the rest of you who are going to be elsewhere other than San Francisco, our regular webcast will happen. It'll just happen on Thursday, it'll happen 6 p.m. California time, and we'll be coming to you from another place, but tune in as usual. We'll be doing it, right, Lily? We're yep, but don't come to, to the writer's house but don't unless come you to the wanna just house. hang out yeah. here. <laughs> yeah, which would be fine. Okay, one more announcement. Molly in Los Angeles, Molly O'Neill, will be convening a meetup on Sunday, this coming Sunday, is uh, October 2nd? This coming Sunday, yep. I think yes. it is? 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. Los Angeles time at the Wanderlust Hollywood, which is a place where uh, Molly spends a lot of her time as well, 1357 North Highland. And I've been there. Did Cliff, did you come to that last year? I've been there twice and it's been great. So that's next weekend. That's this coming weekend, okay? All right, so the second caller is gonna get a book. We're here to talk about imagism. So let's start right away with the caller. Anna, who is it? Uh, we have our uh, near and dear friend Magdalena calling us all the way from Australia. Wow. Yeah. You want to bring her up? I do. Magdalena. Hello, Al. Hi. Hello, everybody. Let's see. It's got to be 11 a.m. Thursday. It is. 11, 11, 11. 11, 11 a.m. the next day, Thursday, because it's Wednesday here. Magdalena Ball, am I right? You're right, because this is the first time I think I'm calling in five years. But I am right. It's Ball. It's great. You were a, you're a pioneer, a founder. We're so glad yes, you're I here. Feel a bit like that. Yeah, no, you're great. And didn't you do like a, 
Didn't you interview me and do a podcast? I did. I did it with Anna. It was Anna, um, and oh, it was a couple of people. That's great. Fantastic. So glad you're with us. Um, uh, how, are you in Sydney or Melbourne? I can't remember which. Melbourne. Uh, uh, no, I'm closer to Sydney, but I'm actually halfway between Newcastle and Sydney, so a little That's bit north cool. of Sydney. Good. Do you have a question? I, or? I, met, I met with Eleanor last week. Eleanor Smagorinsky? So I did, yes. Oh, that yes. is cool. That's ridiculous. We're friends. I know. This is crazy. <laughs> you know, one day you have to shell out all the, you know, all the bananas and clams and peanuts that you have and come over here and hang out with us. I totally plan to do that. Yeah, that would be great. You're welcome anytime. Okay, do you have a question or a comment? I do. I have a question for you. Um, Dave Green and I have been talking at the Mod Pope Plus board about the quantum nature of modern poetry. So this idea of the work existing in multiple states at the same time and, and collapsing to interpretation through the observations of the reader. So we were thinking specifically of Ray Armentrout's anti-short story. Um, but also a lot of the other work this week seems to me to be inspired, influenced by things like the work of Einstein, Heisenberg, um, this idea of rel relativity, uh, so I was just wondering um, what your thinking was, what the thinking of the group was about imagists and their modern successors like Armentrout and that link between science and art in this respect. Whoa. The first call... Chris, can you bring my mic up? The first call is an awesome question, the hardest one. It also refers to Mod Pope Plus which is going to blow people away because Mod Pop Plus is a whole parallel set of... So I'm tempted to dodge the reference to Armentrout a little bit, though the reference is to a poem called Anti-Short Story, which I will find and read because it's so amazing. It's in Mod Pop Plus, and I'm searching for it. Here it is. Ray Armentrout, whom we know from week two as a Dickinsonian and we'll s hang out with her friends in week eight, the language poets, but she appears in Mod Pope Plus under imagism because she learned a lot from HD in particular. And here it is. Here's anti-short story. It's three lines. A girl is running. Don't tell me she's running for her bus. All that aside, I don't think Magdalena, with all due respect, I don't think I want to detour and do a closer reading of that poem right now, though I love it. I'd really rather turn to my colleagues, Emily first, who knows nothing about science. <laughs> yeah. I'd, w I'd, like to, I'd like for us to talk about the, maybe not so much imagism in itself, but mo early modern, it's mostly more British than American in terms of its love of science, but does anybody want to say something about the re natural relationship between the emergence of Magdalena mentions Einsteinian science. Uh, and Jason's looking at me blankly, but he's probably got something to say. Dave Poplar, you're a philosopher, get ready. Emily, say a word or two, please. Um, yeah, uh, when I think of science, because I know nothing about science, I, I think of empiricism and, um, and almost a feeling of almost kind of moral imperative towards discovering something, towards discovering new things. And that's what imagism is trying to do, is um, display certain type of artistic fallacies um, and try to s discover a new way of approaching representation and representing knowledge. Okay, good. Thank you. Dave Poplar, do you have something to say for Magdalena about the relationship between science and this revolutionary poetry? Could you repeat what Magdalena said? Because uh, oh, I'm getting a lot of echo. Mm -hmm. It's uh, really hard to uh, hear when a caller calls in what they're saying. Okay, I'll just I'll do a terrible job of summarizing because she introduced the topic. I mean, she and Dave, which Dave? It's the, it's the famous Dave who did a, who got 125 peer reviews the first year, right? Magdalena, what's Dave's last name? Green. Green. David Green. Dave Green. He's a hero. Um, Dave Poplar, uh, they, they've been talking about the relationship between, you know, the emergence of relativism and Einstein and the co concurrent emergence of this kind of modernism. So it's kind of a general topic. 
Do you have something to say? And if not, you can punt. Well, can I throw something? I'll throw something else in if you want. Sure, um, and please this is do. A quote from, this is a quote from William Carlos Williams um, from his essay, The Poem is a Field of Action. Yeah. So he said, um, and, and Williams is relevant to this week as well. He said, how can we accept Einstein's theory of relativity affecting our very conception of the heavens about us of which poets write so much without incorporating its essential fact, the relativity of measurements into our own category of activity, the right. poem. Right. No, I think that's totally relevant to Williams as a whole. I would push back a little about its relevance to the poems that we're assigning for this week in the main syllabus, which are very still and very imagistic. The one that comes close to this concept of motion and time is, of course, The Rose is Obsolete, which is a, just a masterful poem about time moving and space. But that's a very difficult poem and probably too much for us to bear. I also recommend a little later poem called Perpetuum Mobile, the city, in which the city is thought of as a modernist sculpture dangling down. So Magdalena, um, I, we're gonna, so thank you so much for calling. Actually, Jason has a response and then we're gonna hey, go on. Sure, I, I think that, um, that in a way Emily bringing up empiricism is, is very important because in some sense Einstein's equation of which essentially claims that there's no ultimate difference between matter and energy and then at the same time um, I believe Magdalena is referring to the theory that light is both particle and wave and neither the same and that and, and as well um, the Heisenberg is it Heisenberg? Heisenberg, yeah, right. later, his principle that which is which is later that really uh, an observation determines the state of the object that one is looking at um, that in images, imagism is attempting in part to negotiate between language and, and thing in a, to the point where there is, I think as particularly in HD's poems, there's a shimmer between um, the poem becoming an object or determining an object in where language is meant to be present and kind of shimmering into absence into the image itself so that uh, the image and language are as uncertain as uh, say matter and energy. Uh, thank you. I just want to add, Magdalena, a couple, a couple of points and then we're going to move on to the next call. Uh, Terry Talty reminds us in uh, Twitter that Duchamp's subject in New Descending a Staircase is the fourth dimension. Mm -hmm. uh, that's so relevant to the conversation we're having. And one more thing I'll add, which is that Williams' obsession at this time, because I keep thinking that the imagist Williams is not really this far along in what we're talking about and so we should get back to that but um, his obsession with juxtaposition suggests even as simple as the chickens in the red wheelbarrow is a, a suggestion that all meaning gets created by relation which is going to become very important in the poetry we study later in this course and that things have no meaning unless they are juxtaposed and so basically looking at the chickens and the, the red wheelbarrow in relation is what creates your sense of time and space and nature and that anything in isolation which is essentially the imagist creed is not sufficient so already we move away from that Magdalena thank you so much for calling thanks so much that was wonderful it's great to hear from you and let's let's stay in touch thanks so much Definitely. all right uh, 215-57397 Five, two. I'm going to invite, so Jason, to bring the, the microphone to Emily. 
And Emily has no idea she's being put on the spot here. <laughs> Hi, Emily. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. I'm just going to read a couple of things from Twitter and from Facebook, and you can respond in any way you want sure. to the whole thing. Okay. Uh, let's see. Chris Mustaza, who's watching and tweeting, says that Zach and Chris Martin are the best. I agree. So there's that. Yeah. Uh, Therese Pope, whom we're going to see next week in San Francisco, says, Plum's wheelbarrow and broken glass. Oh, my. Bring on Williams. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, there's not much else here. Uh, so Virgil says hello to Mandana. There's a question in... Um Colleen Knight posted a question that I feel like Go ahead. lead us in a good direction. Yeah. I asked her to clarify, and she hasn't responded yet, but maybe um, she will. She just says, how many blackbirds? How many blackbirds? <laughs> All right. Emily, we're talking about Wallace Stevens' 13 ways of looking at a blackbird. How many blackbirds? Answer Colleen's question. Sure. Uh, um, I mean, I think we can go beyond the idea that there are just 13. Um, I think that we can almost say there's infinite blackbirds, just the way there's 20 mountains and one eye. The, the numbers, I think, are being played with a lot in this poem, and so it's hard to quantify because I think the whole point of all these numbers being thrown around is that there's infinite blackbirds, which maybe means there's an infinite way of seeing things and wow. looking at the world. Okay. Which maybe goes against the Images Manifesto, but I think I don't it's know. Worth I don't think 13. We have to talk about the relation between 13 ways of looking at black, blackbird. I'm trying to talk as fast as you do. Uh, and and Imagism. It's, it's a problem. So I'm going to turn to Ali, Amaris, and Dave. And while I do so, will you give Mandana the mic? Okay. Ali, Amaris, and Dave, we're talking about 13 ways of looking at a blackbird, and the question is, how many? Is it possible that the title doesn't mean 13, but it means here are some 13 of infinite? Uh, Ali, what do you think? I think that's exactly what it means. Um, in fact, I, by the time you get to the last stanza, yeah. you kind of just have that last blackbird on the precipice of everything seems more to me like there are infinite blackbirds. I will read the last stanza to you, Allie, and you can comment. 13. It was evening all afternoon. It was snowing. And it was going to snow. Talk about relativism. The blackbirds sat in the cedar limbs. What do you, get, what do you hear there, Allie? Um, I mean, it actually makes me think of Hemingway, who I guess we'll get to. Yes. In a couple of weeks. Right. Um, I think next week just, in Modpo Plus. Yeah. Um, but what I love about ending that way is that we've seen 13 variations of the blackbird. And we're left with this blackbird in complete stillness, but there's yeah. such a sense of waiting and more to come. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Thank you. Amaris, uh, how many blackbirds? And does it, is, is Emily right that really Stevens is talking to, talking about the infinity or infinitude of cubism breaking things up infinitely based on perception? Yes? I guess I think the question is less is there an infinite number of blackbirds than is there an infinite number of ways of looking at a blackbird? In uh, the yes. poem, the blackbird is still, whereas it's the eye that is constantly moving, so there's an infinite number of point of views or perspectives that you can bring to Are you implying, my dear brilliant friend, that there is an implicit pun on EYE and I subjectivity? Yes. Yes, that's exactly, <laughs> I think, the point of <laughs> isn't, that isn't that amazing, actually, when you think about it? Right? It's, and also, Amaris, where do we, we get an I that's implicit in the speaker? The speaker is seeing lots of blackbirds all over the place. It's almost humorous. But also there's the eye of the blackbird, right? Yeah. Yes. Dave Poplar, 13 ways of looking at a blackbird. How many? Uh, here's a thought that we're not talking about a blackbird. We're talking about just the form of a black blackbird. We're talking about you know, the, the essence of a blackbird. And that sort of uh, holds into I think what we were talking before about the relationship with science, you can look at this as almost a reductive approach uh, where you're trying to get to the pure essence, the smallest uh, unit that you can possibly uh, consider. And it's sort of a materialist approach. So in that way, we're looking at 
a blackbird, the concept, the essence, the platonic form of a blackbird. That's cool. All right, so I'm going to quote some tweets, and I'm going to turn to Mandana and then to the phone, and the second caller gets a book, so that's pretty cool. Okay, uh, so Davey Niddle, who has not been called upon to speak, has tweeted, and therefore doesn't need to speak, I guess. <laughs> Um, I think, in a way, Davey was summarizing what we've been saying, but also, and doing it brilliantly. Uh, Thirteen of infinite ways of looking at a blackbird. Cubism as the infinite breaking up of perception. Hashtag Mod Pro Life. Um, don't go off on this too far, Davey, but in a way, what's happening here is that imagism is like a blink of an eye. There's a moment when imagism is relevant, but very soon, we began to go from the single fantastic Poundian or H. Doolittleian, <laughs> Hilda Doolittleian moment of, of capture, stasis, you know, all the emotions rendered in a single image. And quickly we realize that cubism is a better way of dealing with modern perception. Can you say really briefly why? Because it does push us forward towards Stein and we're not there yet. Well, in spending time with these poems in this, in this space and thinking about them, the Williams poems in particular are putting a lot of pressure for me as I read them on what on how fractal looking is. And there's a difference between understanding, you know, in, in the red wheelbarrow, that looking is inherently fractal and having one representation of how fractal that is. Yes. And in cubism, having infinite representations of how fractal that is yes. in one moment. And so that seems to be a different, having a, the fragment of a look and understanding looking is not infinite in a Dickinsonian way, but necessarily partial. To yes. be able to multiply that partiality is just a more accurate kind of partiality. Yeah, that's really great. That's great. No doubt that moment will be, will be edited and become a video clip in Modpo <laughs> because that was just so definitive. Um, I think of The Rose is Obsolete, Davey. Um, the Rose is Obsolete is a, like a battle cry for imagism, and yet that's only the first line of this poem that's really more cubist than imagist. The Rose is Obsolete is something that HD absolutely mastered in the Sea Rose, for instance, right? The Rose is Obsolete, so it must be precise, it must be stinted, it must be, it must be condensed, it must be true, it must be the thing, right? But The Rose is Obsolete, is the first line of a poem that goes way off into cubism. The rose is obsolete, but, but each petal ends in an edge. And this is a cubist rose. The double facet cementing the grooved columns of air, the edge cuts without cutting, meets dash nothing dash renews itself in metal or porcelain. Whither it ends, but if it ends, the start is begun so that to engage roses becomes a geometry. Oh my God! You know, Williams just blows right past imagism there. Okay, that's cool. Mandana, I'm gonna ask you a question that's just coming to mind. Easy, easy. easy? come on, no, put the mic up there. Let's, uh, there, hello. <laughs> How are you? I'm great, how are you? Okay, are? good. All right, great. So what are you thinking all these years later, you've been studying imagism with us, you've been studying the rise of modernism. Right. Is there something still fresh about encountering all this, clearing away the gloop, reducing the rhetoric down to precision? Uh, you know, Williams daring to take a refrigerator, mo no refrigerator note and make it a poem, all that. Is it still fresh? Is there anything in there that's still revolutionary for you? Yes, um, and especially listening to some of what was going on tonight. They're trying to reduce everything to the very smallest atom. but going back to the scientific conversation, but there's no real way to see that smallest atom. And so to some extent, imagism is much more full of possibility mm -hmm. than the most complex poems that, that we read. Also, from a historical perspective, I look at where they were during the imagist times and where we are now. It's about 100 years later. And 
kind of from that smallest atom comes a very big explosion. So the imagism has a lot of resonance for me now, yeah. not just as language, but thinking about the big explosion from the very, very tiny moat. Yeah, that's, that's well put. That's great. Thank you, Mandana. By the way, Shirley Collins says, hello, everybody. Hello, Mandana. Right? And, you know, this, just, this is in the uh, sub forum, which is so much fun, and there's a lot of talk about Struggle Street. And somebody said that Al's looking svelte. <laughs> Kate Boykin Williams, where are you? Come to the writer's house and say that to my face. Just want to say Al's looking svelte. Okay, Anna, who do we have on the phone? This person receives a book. Oh, I see. Because they're preparing for the trip to California. You got it. You guys are sharing a we mic. Are share. This yeah. is like Apollo 10. <laughs> Or, or something like that. Uh, we Are have you our mocking friend. me because I couldn't get that Apollo analogy out? What? No, never. Who do we have? We have our friend Rob calling us from Oakland, and he has a really, really fascinating question about imagism and sound. Wow. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. It's doozy. Get ready. Okay. <laughs> Hello, Rob. Hello. How are you? Can you hear me okay? Yes, but we're still right here. Oh, so man, I'm jealous of you. That's really cool. Um, is, you, you're not Rob I'm Holland. Off while, I'm off a little while to discuss how the Irish state civilization, but uh, right, so I have a little more modest goals right now here. <laughs> Rob, what's your last name? Brylowski. Oh, you're, Bo you're Bob. Yeah. You're our guy. Yeah. Are you coming to our things next week? I hope so. There, I'll have to... I haven't sent the RSVP in yet there, but I'm hoping to get down there. Yeah, I hope, I hope so. You, we, you came uh, in January, when we were out there You're in January. Yeah. Yep. Great. Do you have a question? Oh, Bob, you get a book. Uh, the second caller gets a book. Um, I would like to give you, and Anna will send this to you, I'd like to give you Peter Gizzi's book, Threshold Songs. I'm holding it up. Okay. Okay, you're not overwhelmed by it. Should I give you another book? Well, wait, I, I don't, I don't know these, I don't know the writers there, so. Uh, I'm oh, just, Gizzy's I'm, great. There's also, also delay in between what you're doing here. All right. Well, you can barter with Anna later if you don't want this. But anyway. Um, <laughs> well, it's, it's not the ones I just, I'm not, I'm not often familiar with a lot of the uh, the new poets there, so uh, I'll, I'll leave it to your judgment. Okay. You, uh, great. Okay. Do you have a question, Bob? And because the sound, your sound isn't perfect. We'll hear your question, and then we'll answer after you hang up, okay? Okay, so okay, what I'm great. calling about is that, you know, historically, you know, you go back to, you know, its origins, their poetry was a, a auditory project, product there. You know, people, it was involved with sounds and, you know, and rhyming and rhythm, and this was the way that people transmitted history and culture and learning there, and it was... And, it was, and for a long time, you know, that the poetry was largely rooted in the in the sounds of the of the words and the yes and the ideas. But you know, starting certainly you know, with the printing press, and then we we see examples with Emily Dickinson early on, and then the images are doing more with that. And some of our other poets, it seems as we get more and more, and as we get to the 21st century, we're primarily a visual culture here, and. I mean, I have to confess, when I look at the poetry, I don't tend to read it I, out loud or, or listen to it necessarily, although the, when you have tapes, I'll listen, I listen to them, but I have, my first tendency is to read yes. and to look at it, and they, or maybe look at the layout on the page, but it's, it's a visual, primarily a visual there, and my concern is the question of whether, what does this mean in terms of poetry changing its nature, or, or how can we, you know, or how do you not lose the auditory you know, the, the roots of poetry, yeah. which is in uh, the love that's of a, rhythm and sound, and how do we not lose that with all the kind yeah. of visual tricks and, and all the various visual manipulations that... Thank you, Bob. Tend to see Thank okay. you for asking the question. We'll respond to it. Um, why don't you hang up and then listen to the answer that we give uh, through your video feed. Great. All right, and we'll see you next week. Okay. Thanks, Bob. Great. Um, I don't think Bob is right that the uh, contemporary is particularly non-oral. In fact, a, a, it's more so because of the ubiquity of availability of recordings. Uh, there was a period where, before recordings became ubiquitous, where poetry was very visual. And of course, the imagists are primarily a visual group. 
And later, someone like Williams, to some degree, pound not at all HD. When she recorded her stuff, she recorded her later Freudian stuff and le less of the images stuff. But Williams came out and he did all of his old visual stuff as audio. So, so the, but, but Bob's really referring to the original, you know, the, the first poetry of 8,000, 10,000, or 40,000 years ago certainly was very oral. Um, do we want to uh, say a couple of things? It's not really so much relevant to this week because this is a very visual week. So, um, Lily, a thought or two on uh, orality? Well, yeah, I think that's maybe, um, unless I was misunderstanding, like sort of part of his question was, if we're looking at um, so much depends upon bread wheelbarrow, um, and it is so visual, how can we bring auditory elements into our reading if we're so uh, instinctively in first glance and second glance and third glance, like pushed to a more visual realm? Um, and so I think like with images particularly, this kind of goes to what Jason was saying before, like there's a, um, if we're gonna try to fuse poem with object or like poem with thing that's being described, the, um, we have to take the sound of those words, like maybe the fact that it's difficult to say red wheelbarrow should be part of how we read that poem. Yeah. Like yeah. we always trip over it by accident or the, yeah. Um, maybe um, the crisp language of uh, HD's, you know, um, flower being flung on the crisp sand is right. um, part of the the alliteration and the sounds your um, face and your your mouth has to make is like part of that scene. And you, what you're saying in part is that even the most imagistic visual poetry of the imagists that poem, The Sea Rose, sounds mm -hmm. remarkable when yeah. it's performed. Almost more so because it is so sparse of language that you need yeah. to, I'm so, I mean, I, I give this advice to a lot of people who struggle with, if they're saying like, I really don't get this poem, I always say to read it out loud if you don't have a recording of it, or even if you do, because it just changes how you hear it. Yeah, and I, I think um, Williams famously, uh, Ron Silliman, who's a poet we meet later in the course, often says that Williams misreads his own poems. Because Williams' poems are so adamant about their line endings, but he reads right past them. Uh, so let's just listen to Williams. Chris Martin, you ready? Let's just listen to Williams say, uh, 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 this is just to say, and see if it flows rather than breaks at the lines. Here it is. This is William Carlos Williams in 1950, a fairly rare recording on the radio, WOSU. October 7th, 1950. This is just to say, I have eaten the plums that were in the icebox and which you were probably saving for breakfast. Forgive me, they were delicious, so sweet and so cold. He almost reads it like a little short story, mm -hmm. which is not how the poem looks on the page. So, yeah. you know, this is really... It's not really a response to Bob's very good question, but um, the orality of poetry comes back in this course in week six with the beats, and if you do Mod Po Plus, all of the oral traditions that resurface in response to the beat, beats, such as performance poetry. And um, Edwin Torres, who has a poem in that week called Dude Descending a Staircase. It's a performance poem, and Edwin Torres is coming to the writer's house to do uh, lots of things next semester, and we'll be getting some more recordings of him. He's a performance poet, an oral poet, who also calls himself a lingualisualist. A lingualisualist. So he's, and he, his, his course is called Brain Lingo, and he's really interested in merging all these senses. Um, Anna, you have two things to do. One is to say something you saw on your smartphone, and the other is to tell us about the next caller. Uh, well, I was just going to uh, give a shout out to and also read a tweet um, from our wonderful friend Joe Massey, um, who has a response to Bob's question. Wait, he's tweeting? He oh, is. Yes, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, I see him. So Joe says, um, sound is crucial in all imagist influence poets I love, but the music is microtonal. Microtonal. Mm. Joe. I know, he's so is, brilliant. Joe is at Poetry Bunker, and he is obviously watching... The webcast, that's really cool. So cool, thank All right. you, Joe. Hey, Joe. Uh, before we get to the phone, uh, Lily, you're looking at tweets, and oh, I'm looking Facebook. at the uh, 
So I am looking at the Facebook page. Sorry, I'm slow to get there. Not too much going on on Facebook right as yet. Yeah, it's true. Although Therese Pope says, I highly recommend listening to Williams. Um, in the sub forum, which is a lot of fun here, uh, oh, Kate Boy Boykin Williams responds to my response to her saying I look svelte. LOL, we'll do it one of these days, Al, she says. And Pamela Corbett says, this is a lot of fun. Say hi to Mandana. Hi, Mandana. Um, Pamela Corbett, hey, Al, during our Modpo meetup in New York City, which was last, this past weekend, Mandana organized it, we began discussing the difference between poetry and prose. What is the difference between poetry and prose? Pamela, such a great question, I'm going to defer it, but it was sort of implicit in my thing about uh, Williams reading the poem like prose. Maybe we can get back to that. Meantime, some tweets, Lily? Got some I actually think ones? Davey's on the tweets. I'm on the tweets. Davey. Um, I one of the tweets I'm really enjoying is Colleen Knight, uh, who says, reading sea poppies and sea roses out loud is on my list of things to do. Still don't understand their relation to imagism. And what I love about that is what's implicit in it is that hearing the an, an imagist poem aloud might allow you to understand how its images operate, that, it's Im that the images of imagist poems are inherently sonic, that they yeah. only exist in sound, which is sort of what Joe seems like he's saying, yeah. that hearing the microtonality of an imagist poem is what makes it available. Yeah. Yeah, Oops. Emily's just nodding because she. I bet you don't do Twitter at all, do you? Oh, not so much. <laughs> you are so funny. <laughs> Shannon Ratliff says, "Every time I hear that recording by Williams, it makes me want to smack him." Yes, <laughs> Shannon. Shannon. <laughs> Agree. <laughs> that poem or all of those? Well, that poem because that poem, right? Because it's a refrigerator poem. He steals the plums. Well, no, it's more than that. It's um, we know from Flossie's reply that he's made an intentional Ooh. political within his relationship choice to take the one thing she wanted when there were dozens of other things right. he could have taken. Yeah, d a d domestic politics, and, and, and I think in the video we made that we call it sexual politics, mm -hmm. certainly he's playing a game uh, between uh, the, you know, what each of them wants, desire and appetitiousness, and on the other hand, the poetry he can get from all that conflict. Right, but one of them does a lot more domestic work in their relationship than the yes, other. Yes, according so. to Flossie's <laughs> reply, he doesn't even know how to put the water on. He right. needs to be instructed to boil the water. Shannon's going to slap him around. <laughs> I'm um, with Shannon. <laughs> yeah, cool. Uh, Anna, we have someone on the phone. We do. We have our uh, friend Mama Pope calling us. Oh. She's actually on the East Coast, believe it or not. Wait, Mama Pope is in the East Coast and we're going to the West Coast? I know. But she'll be there too. Anyway, she would like to give us a shout out, so she just okay. wanted to say a quick hi. All right. Hello, Al. Hey, buddy. Does this mean that you're not you're on the East Coast? No, no. I'm leaving Saturday so I can make uh, my San Francisco debut. <laughs> Wait a minute. You with you? You are coming. To, you are coming. I've been I've been home in my hometown for almost a month, and I'm leaving. I was leaving Saturday, uh, and we were excited to know that you being in San Francisco wouldn't interfere with my vacation. I don't want to interfere with your vacation. You have never interfered with it. But you know what? I have to tell you, Zach Cardner, who's coming with us to California, he loves those meatballs. So Can I if, bring them? Yes, Can if I you bring, bring them, them okay. we'll bring them back to our hotel in Palo Alto and we're going to have a okay. meatball party. <laughs> All right, I'll pro I promise it will be meatballs. Zach, okay? do we have, Chris, do we have um, microwaves in uh, the hotel? Do you remember? So we're gonna, what happens when you micro, microwave Mama Pope's meatballs? Do they explode? I don't no, know. No, they they won't explode because I'll probably have them in soft. You know, maybe uh, I'll make them fresh so when I give them to you, you can just heat them up. There are poss I think I'll do it right there. There are possibly a thousand people now who are totally confused by this conversation. Okay. I think I should. I think I should explain. I'm so sorry. I'm no. Go ahead. Explain. Mama Pope has always talked about her meatballs, and then one day she came here and made meatballs and spaghetti for the writer's house people. And last year she sent them to me in <laughs> what? Uh, what's frozen, it was frozen, remember, in a priority overnight. Overnight with like, wa what's that ice called, that smoky ice? No, I didn't have to use it. I froze no, you, them. I froze them. The, po the post office said you can't do any of that. Well, so I just froze them solid, and you got them the next yeah. morning. 
Well, there, it's a little, Kate Boykin Williams, she is pro svelte, and your meatballs make me some other thing. So I had to stretch that out over a month eating those meatballs. Anyway, we're using up a lot of webcast no, time talking no, about the I meatballs and my No, diet. no, I'm sorry. I wanted to just make a point about, um, because I'm so excited about this week's visual. Yes. And, you know, I am an amateur photographer, and one of my favorite things to photograph are roses. And we, when you were talking about the edge of the rose and things yes. like that, it becomes just, a geometry. Yeah. I was going to say that it, it's just in my mind when I'm photographing and I see sometimes even with water on the petal, it just, it, it's, it's exciting. I can't write about it, but I, I just wanted to say thanks yes. for doing the visual this week. <laughs> and oh, I yeah. love you guys. I love you all. I love don't want to too, take up and your time. We will we will see you in a few days in San Francisco. Yes, we will. That'll Have be fun. Safe, yeah, safe travels to you all. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the uh, what Joyce is saying is that the um, the photo photography, this kind of photography, becomes really important just at the same time mm -hmm. as there's all this visual poetry, and so it's, it it makes a lot of sense. Um, Davy, what are you thinking? Uh, I'm I'm thinking about all of the um, meatball tweets that are. Mm -hmm. that, are there that, some meatball that, tweets? There are a huge number. That Aristotle just, says, yeah. of course they don't explode. They're not dreams deferred. They're but, dreams now. Yeah, what? it's a our, our How many poetry our, people around here. Our Twitter conversation has devolved into uh, how amazing it would be if Emily were on Twitter, <laughs> and how great meatballs are. Listen, I think the world would fall apart if Emily got on Twitter. <laughs> you know why? I'm Emily? sure you'll, you'll tell me how. It has to do with this <laughs> week, though, the Imagists. Mm, Let's talk about... You, you are really... When you really admit what you love, it's the long Nabokovian sentence. Yeah. And probably if I could turn you on Faulkner, he'd be in there, too. <sighs> Not so much, but kind, kind of. Right? You know <laughs> what I'm talking about. Yeah. Uh -huh. And so... Emily Arnett, I mean, here we are all talking about the glories of condensation, and you really love what we, what we used to call the periodic <laughs> sentence, late Henry James. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Twitter, Oof. not for you. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a little too compressed. Some too people condensed. have said, I guess I want to ask Ali and Amaris and Dave this. Some people have said jokingly about Twitter that it was anticipated by the imagist revolution that move from Victorian and Edwardian bloviating to this precision. The influence of haiku in the United States, which has always been around, that is to say that influence, um, really kind of predates this thing we have now where everybody tries to put things into something precise. Any comments about the relationship between this week's work and the state we're in where everybody's trying to be. I know there's a lot of people, including Lily, who've thought about Twitter, and probably this is just ridiculous, but I just wanted to open up the topic. Allie, any thoughts about uh, the Twitter sphere? Uh, and I'll watch uh, Emily wince when, she ta when you talk. Well, I don't want to blow Emily's cover, but she is in, she is in fact on Twitter. <laughs> all all what, what did she say? I didn't hear it. I do, in fact, have a Twitter that I uh, don't use except for self-promotion and lurking on other people. <laughs> wow, okay. And what is the handle? I actually, what is it, Allie? The, I think it's the real Emily Harnett. The real oh, Emily yeah. Harnett. Okay, uh, all you Twitter people, this is the funniest webcast we've done ever. <laughs> yeah, so we're, straying from, <laughs> we're straying from our poems. <laughs> Are you mad about that? No. No. This is cool, though. Somebody's doing. <laughs> well, on top, not for Emily. Maybe. singing on top of spaghetti. <laughs> Blew my cover. Bonnie Larson Steger on top of spaghetti, all covered with cheese. I lost my poor meatball when Al Filri sneezed. This is that's a rhyming poem. We don't do. Oh, Joe Massey. So much depends upon meatballs. Now, Joe just did. There's going to be a poem, Joe. Um, Amaris, do you have anything wise to say about the relationship between the Imagist Revolution and our new? interest in the radical condensation of language? Um, <laughs> you can pass if you want. Yes, myself not being on Twitter, 
I feel like this is the wrong for Lily. Okay. <laughs> Lily's chomping at the bit because she's really thought about Twitter. Go ahead, Lil. Well, the difference is access and who... Um, well, there's a lot of differences. Corporatization is one. Like, there are a lot of ads on Twitter, and, like, it's been monetized as, like, an ad space. So that's, like, very different from... Uh, it's not unrelated to, like, taking a Gertrude Stein poem and turning it into a Hallmark card, like, a rose is a rose, is a rose or whatever. Um, but it is... Like, so that, that's an element to it. But then there's also, like... Yeah, there's access. Like, anyone can be on Twitter... You don't have to get your poem published to be on Twitter. Um, you don't have to be the kind of person who would have success in publishing right. uh, in your time period to get to voice your opinion right. um, on Twitter. So that's like a, a pretty big difference. Right. But like in terms of the restricted uh, space of the language, like that's a similarity. But yes. that's like a um, yes, like you were saying, like yeah. that's like a. Uh, common across a lot of different modes of Right, and, and the c comparison is superficial. I want to um, turn to Jason on this question, but just I just want to throw in that um, I do a lot of tweets. I'm really interested in Twitter, and I think 80% of the tweets that get, do we say like the heart? Mm -hmm. We say like. 80% um, of the stuff that gets retweeted or liked or passed around and becomes hot, memeish, is stuff that's ridiculous cliche, the, the perfect turn of phrase, the perfect moment, and so much of it is exactly the opposite of what this group of poets wanted to do. They wanted to say the, the most, the most unobvious thing. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, I mean, these, the apparition of these faces in the crowd, petals on a wet black bow, that's a fantastic tweet, right? But it's not the tweet that get, would get retweeted because it doesn't like clinch it. It doesn't, it's not a nail on the head kind of thing. Um, and I may be unfairly generalizing about the yeah. best tweeting. Yeah, because... can be very open-ended and right. difficult. Right, there's politics, there's humor, there's weird Twitter, there's, like, many different channels and forms, and they all kind of cross over each other, but they're, like, what's maybe similar about an analog to the poetry world is, like, there can be people who only use Twitter for, like, news and don't know that there are whole Twitter accounts that just tweet... Um, every word in the dictionary with which attached to the end of it or yeah. whatever <laughs> and like those are great <laughs> Jason thoughts on this um, yeah a couple um, I think it's it's dangerous to to generalize too much about what Twitter can do when we have the person who should not be named who's <laughs> run a presidential is Voldemort running for president mm -hmm. perhaps but um, that it can be uh, that compression can allow for lots of state lots to slip by um and it also depends so much upon who who the tweeter is mm -hmm. um but i was thinking more about meatballs and thinking about whether a meatball is a, is it compressed meat <laughs> or is it i mean because a meatball is why are we? Why do we love meatballs so much? I think is one I only question. like Joyce Joyce Pope's meatballs. Well, my my grandma, my Italian grandma, made homemade meatballs, and I know the the process of making them is is. Anyway, the, but what I really wanted to talk about is <laughs> is to go back to where we were before, um, because everyone's excitement about meatballs, I think, has to do with all of the sensory aspects that that word evokes it's not just so with images and where the word that the that they for the movement is images and to focus on sight but when we move to williams's note that you played we get into other senses as well and taste Taste, temperature, tac the tactility, yeah. um, and which brings me back to the thing that is the most puzzling, which I think is why Williams wouldn't read the lines as lines. Like, in a sense, he's compressing vocally, like, auditorially what he has into one Ob one smushed thing of mm -hmm. sound. Yeah. And I think 
thinking about why he he would do that or what and what the dif really what the difference is between the sonic and the visual for language itself as language is hovering in between the sonic and the visual in itself yeah. and then hovering in between potentially hovering in between the five senses in terms of what it's evoking content wise um, is something that the that the images push to the forefront in terms of pressuring it to the point of like uh, Mandana said of, of exploding and but why I mean I would like to read an essay by somebody giving me an answer on why uh, Williams would have not found, wh why he would have treated the audio event as a different thing than the vi visual event. I, I, I also want to read that essay, but I think it may have been written because there's a, since, since, since the Penn Sound page, which is the collected Williams, there isn't a single recording of Williams that's not on that page, so it's the collected Williams. And the uh, history of the, of the performances of Between Walls itself, and I think there's actually a link in Modpo to the four or five different recordings of that poem. The older he gets and the more infirm, because he had two strokes and in between the first and the second one, he did between walls. And the constraint that's, uh, that's mild in the earlier versions of that poem, the feeling of constraint, because it is between walls but there, uh, and nothing will grow, but among the cinders is this shining green broken piece of glass which creates life. And so the earlier versions of that poem are full of energy. The, l the last version of the poem makes you feel like he's suffering from the infirm re that is the hospital itself and things are closing in on him. Why don't I play the last, the last recording of this famous poem and let's see. Ready Chris Martin? This is the, just, a, just a few more. Um, this has no title. Between walls, the back wings of the hospital where nothing will grow lies cinders in which shine the broken pieces of a green bottle. That was the last poem. Um, what do you hear, Emily? Uh, briefly distracted by the bottle. <laughs> However, he says that. Word. Yeah, he always says it that way. Yeah. Yeah, um, but there's also, as I always notice with Williams, there's so much kind of joy in the way he reads. Um, and I'm of the comment before uh, talking about orality and kind of the way he um, reads things as though that, um, they're a children's story um, almost, and that there's uh, kind of no more kind of oral tradition than a children's story, and nothing more generous than kind of mm. telling um, a children's story. And uh, yeah, there's something really lovely about hearing that kind of intonation and this. So kind the poem of on the page does not come off like a children's story, but read by mm -hmm. Jiminy Cricket here. Oh, yeah, exactly. Is what he sounds like. <laughs> It suggests a new genre, mm -hmm. which might be the happy story for children who live in the post-industrial society or the, you know, the, the, the New Jersey, uh, where I grew up, right near Doc Williams, uh, you know, playing, playing out on the highway and uh, seeing the shine uh, off the broken glass. Uh, that's where life is. It's a, it is kind of a little tale. Davy, what do you hear? I hear the poem sounding really far away from him. And that's something that it, him reading the poem more than him speaking uh, before he starts reading really feel, uh, feels like it, it temporalizes the stroke and yeah. really feels like the stroke is 
takes up the space between him and the poems. Mm. And in thinking about the, the recording of the Red Wheelbarrow that we listened to earlier in this webcast, it feels like the language is much closer to him and the, the words themselves are much closer together. And so it's interesting to have, you know, between walls take up so much space um, longitudinally on the page because it feels like in the recording it takes up so much space laterally. Yeah. Just the words come really far apart that it takes, it feels a little bit like driving in the way that you would see one thing and then seeing something else and then see something else. And there's something kind of tragic, there's something really sad about hearing how much time having a stroke puts between things. Right, and the poem ironically, as I mentioned a minute ago, is set in a hospital. But he, when he wrote the poem very early in his career, I guess the late 20s or 30s, um, you know, he's thinking about, he's a doctor on break and he's looking out and he sees this thing. Years later, he's the patient. So when you get to, in the poem, when you read it, you get to hospital where nothing will grow lie, my favorite line, will grow lie cinders in which shine the broken pieces, and of course broken pieces breaks it up. When he reads it as a person with a stroke, he's going to be able to say cinders in which, because of the um, slide, the elision there, cinders in which. But then when he does the anon shine, I've listened to this too much, when he, get, when he, hears the an, when he does the anon shine, he needs to recover because it's very hard for a stroke victim to say in which shine the and now you got the TH in the front of the teeth. So he, he elides and then stops. We'll, where nothing will grow lie cinders in which shine the broken pieces of a green bottle. So the stroke determines the orality and the orality splits not cinders in which shine but the relationship between the shining and the broken. And I am very moved by that when in 1954 he's just. Uh, Mandana doesn't have a mic, but she just said tremendous beauty in that. Let's get you a mic. Yeah. Um, the beauty in that is that we have to listen differently to it. And maybe we have a different experience of the poem. Yeah. So he, we don't get to have the same experience each time with the poem, which is exactly why I can take Mod Po for five years, is that I don't always have the same experience with the poem. And, and we shouldn't have the same experience yeah. with the poem. I mean, keep the mic for a second, Mendan, because this is the crux of why I can teach this course for 30 years, why we can do Mod Po for five years, why there's still more to do. Even in this image, the images week should be, Lily, the one week where we can just say, okay, we've been there and done that. <laughs> but there's still poems that just do what Mandana's been saying. And can anyone try to put a finger on that? Mandana, we'll start with you, but uh, maybe Allie, Lily, and Emily. Why don't you each take a turn? What you're trying to answer is what Mandana's already suggesting, which is the that the radical openness of this work makes it truly impossible to be done with it. And Williams remaking it constantly as he lives with the poems is a lot like the reader's own experience growing up or growing old with the poems, right? So that um, what a t former teacher of mine used to call the fate of rereading. Mm. So I came into, Terence Dupre, I came into his office one day and he said to me, when you're older, you will realize the fate of rereading. Well, what, Terrence? Who's, what? Well, anything, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely anything. So in one way, you'll read a novel about the death of a parent, and you'll think about how much, how hard it was on the child. And then later, when you grow older, the book will read completely differently. Right. Um, Mandana first on this question, and then I think I said Lily and Emily. Two things, if you don't mind. First, uh, you know how much I love theater. I've seen King Lear probably 10 or 12 times. And people say, how can you see King Lear so often? You know exactly what, which most people die at the end. That's Shakespeare. Everybody dies at the end. <laughs> but when I first saw King Lear, 
I saw it as Cordelia. I could feel the tragedy of how could you, how could you abandon me the way you did. Right. And the older I'm getting, I see the tragedy of Lear himself. Of Lear himself. So part right. of it is that we're growing and we're changing. But with respect to this week in imagism, I think there's something inherently distancing about it, because it is a photograph. And that doesn't necessarily bring us into it emotionally. But with the distance, we have much more opportunity to delve deeper into it. So I'm not as emotionally engaged in some ways, but because of that, I can go deeper into it, analyze it deeper, do, um, to use Williams, to do more of a dissection of it. Mm -hmm. So there is a certain distance to it for me, um, especially when we look at a lot of the Stevens stuff in, in Mod Po Plus, but that's what keeps me coming back again and mm -hmm. again and again, because I want to get a little more, I want to get more intimate mm -hmm. with it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Lily? This is like a weird answer maybe, but um, I think what's important to, about keep continuing to study these images poems for me is like, I'm very, in general, very wary of this idea of efficiency or con like e exacting control, um, which was kind of like part of this images manifesto. And so I think that that can be scary because like if you're doing something the most efficient way, you might be causing someone else harm who some, somewhere along the way by cutting them out or avoiding them or whatever. So I think like I'm interested in imagism for like the project of it, but also in like thinking about how to um, push back on an idea of e efficiency and exacting control, um, which was their like tried and failed project. And we talked about like the downsides of it with pounds the encounter when that control is applied to another person um, and they're not given their chance to be heard or mm. be reached or whatever. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm interested in revisiting. Mm -hmm. um, Hakur Mar said a kind of rough version of what you just said. Um, he or she said, it, if it has an accountant, it's probably not poetry. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Uh, Emily, why do we keep coming? Why do we live with this stuff for years and years? Why why is it always there? Um, well, I've I'm, yeah, I've never um, I haven't really loved imagism. It's, it's never of all the things we study. It's never been the thing that I've naturally um, gravitated towards. But I really like the exercise of rereading on its own terms, talking about um, this Williams poem as a kind of coda to a life almost that you can uh, that Williams can also live through. There's something. Um, really beautiful about that, um, life affirming about that. And if you see kind of rereading something as believing that um, one particular unit of meaning can keep yielding meaning over and over again and renew itself um, in a certain way, uh, yeah, then re reading is a kind of um, an investment in a life and investment in reading is a part of life. Mm. Well said. We have someone on the phone and uh, let's see what's going on there. Hi, so, Anna. Hi. Uh, so we've got our friend Chris calling us again from Georgia, okay. and he um, has a question. I think it's along these lines. Um, he wanted to um, ask about the relationship between imagism and content, um, specifically relating to the, some of the conversations that were happening in that struggle street. Form versus content. About. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's bring Chris up. Hello, Chris. Hey. How you doing, Al? I'm great. Um, would you like to uh, ask your question and then uh, hang up and listen to our response through the webcast? Yeah, that would be great. Okay, go ahead. Let ask your question. Um, all I'm, all I'm asking, uh, we're having this big discussion on um, this thread, um, Struggle Street, yes. um, form versus content. Right. And um, with the images, they're trying to like sort of uh, revamp, um, you know, the way language is used and stuff to, um, you know, um, um, sort of, um, you know, like the image of a, of a rose as a, a love and beauty and blah, 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 and like trying to revamp stuff like that. That's right. I saw, that I saw your like comments big, about that. Right. Doesn't that put a big, like, um, doesn't that kind of stress content as opposed to form? Yeah, such a good question. Great, Chris. That was fantastic. Um, you're setting a record for three 
we three webcasts in a row calling us. I'm glad you did. I'm glad you're so active in the course. We all <laughs> I, 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 I love this stuff. I mean, you know, I'm loving it. I'm really, Great. you know, it's had me real motivated and stuff. Great. And, we really appreciate so. your involvement. So thank you. We're, so we're going right. to so you hang up. We're going to answer the question and, okay. and talk to you soon. Thank you so all much. Right. Take, Take care, care man. Um, would you? So we'll, that'll be the last call for the night. So uh, we're done with our calls. Um, so, Davey, Chris's question basically is saying, I, uh, Chris had posted in Struggle Street, uh, form versus content, saying, at, at first he said, um, you know, uh, I, what's wrong with roses? I like roses. Why are we b beating up on roses? And, and then I, I went in as like a teacher. I shouldn't do this because it's just, but I felt like, no, we're not talking about roses. We're talking about representations of roses and representations of roses had gotten and still have gotten very stale and very predictable and very trite and very hallmarky, right? And then... I'm pretty sure it was me in the video who was beating up on roses. Yeah, so <laughs> roses are, roses are, we're not talking about roses, everybody loves roses. I mean, I think we all like roses. I like, I like unusual roses, but still, roses are cool. It's representations of roses that have abused the ready-made symbolism of roses. So what Chris is saying is when we push back about that, aren't we just doing content? Where's the form? Ha, ha, ha. And Dave, Davey's looking at me saying, I'm not sure I know how to answer this. So after Davey, we'll go to Amaris on the question of isn't the pushing back against roses just a content problem? And where's the form and all that? Davey, go for it. I'm gonna go ahead and say that's not a content problem because um, a rose operating in an imagist poem is necessarily a formal object. Yes. And so there isn't really, there isn't content that's populating, that's populating, uh, populating HD's C Rose poem. Right. But what we're, what we're thinking about is the formal object of the rose. Right. And so the goal of that poem is, you know, to have to go back to what you were saying about juxtaposition, to juxtapose the rose against itself, to be able to put the object of the rose, to push, use the object of the rose to push back against representation. And I think that if you're using a feature of something's form to bring it back to having a form that a representation of a rose mm -hmm. is formless in some ways, it, it gets away from the actual formal gestural right. structural object right. of the rose and it's militantly formalist it's saying no this thing has a form it has all of these spaces it has all of these shapes and a rose is kind of a great object to be thinking about because itself is you know it in and of itself is so iterable it's so fractal right it's, i'm getting i'm getting really angry about this as i'm talking mm -hmm. about it uh i think yeah it has to be a problem of form davy martian sees rose martian comes to earth sees rose yes everybody's going oh and the Martian says, uh, what's the connection between that thing, which is an interesting looking thing, and all this swooning? Answer is a formal question. It's a matter of what that object has accreted in the history of representation. Hmm. There must have been somebody, somebody, I'm being silly now, this is, this is, a, this is like a comedy routine, but somebody whose name was Og or Murray, you know, was the first one to say, Rose means love. And everybody went, wow, what a great idea. And then it sort of got trite after that. But like it the became a dead metaphor instantly. But like the rose that means love like doesn't have like a scent and like structure and like petals and like reproductive qualities. And the Martian has a formal relationship to it. A Martian is like, what is this thing? Can I eat it? Like what happens? Like can I like poke you with it? Like what do I do you with can this thing? Po I would right. think it would be a weapon. Like if I throw foremost, this at you, is that interesting? Get like away from me with that rose. <laughs> Right, like it has to be like in, interacting with something as though for the first time is a formal problem. Yes. So in some ways, yes. it's a question of pushing content as far away as possible to be able to only yes. deal with form. Yes, uh, Maurice, um, you still with us on this rose question? I'd love to hear your thought on that, and I believe Jason Emily wants to say something about it. Uh, Amaris, your thoughts? Sure, I guess as you guys were saying, the rose in romantic poetry was kind of positioned as this object for. Um, contemplation, admiration, and the images were dispensing with those overused connotations to replace it into sort of a harsh reality, um, putting it in a new modern light that reflected kind of the brokenness of the time. Yeah. But that necessarily also changes the form of the poem because we have to move away from those beautiful musical um, lines that sort of 
beautify and idealize the rose into these short, concise um, poems full of harsh consonants, um, harsh images. So they naturally have a relationship that both have to change in order to modernize the image of the rose. Thank you, Amaris. Uh, uh, Zach, would you sh sh close in on one of T's famous cards? So a rose is a rose is a rose. Is, was Stein's, that's not quite an accurate, uh, not quite an accurate quotation, but what does that mean, Emily? A rose is a rose is a rose means what? The, the rose that there's, um, a rose is ultimately at the end of the day an object. Say that again. Um, a rose at the end of the day is an object, is the thing that's- It's a um, rose, mm -hmm. right. If you just said a rose is a rose, that would be a way of saying, we all know what roses are, they're roses. But a rose is a rose is a rose is rather insistent. It's saying it is a thing, right? How you say what you say is what you say, which is the answer to Chris's question. It is form. There's very little content in this. I mean, when you think about the content of the wheelbarrow poem, really? Chickens in a wheelbarrow, so what? I mean, you can say, and Chris wouldn't be wrong to say, it's a poem about a wheelbarrow and chickens, and chickens are things and wheelbarrows are things, and that's reality, and it's a description of reality, but Williams would not have described reality if that's all there was. And there, the form, how you say what you say, is in the juxtaposition of the two things. Okay, Emily, your thought on this, and then we're gonna go around and get final words. Sure, I was just going to respond to Chris by saying that I do think the form of the Imagist poem reflect the Imagist mission to make things really precise and to the point. Um, Ezra Pound's in a station at the Metro is two lines, lines is two lines, and I think these really short poems with only a few words in them um, reflect the Imagist goal of being really precise and really to the point and really specific. Um, so I, th I don't think we have to worry with the Imagist that the content is is the only thing doing the work here because I think the form does the work as well um, in the sense that a lot of the images, poem, Pound and Williams are very short and very to the point. Form does work. Form does work, says Emily. Form does work. That's a really outrageous thing to say. I dare you to go out into mm -hmm. the mainstream of the university community and go up to somebody and say, form does work. That's a really counterintuitive thing to say, but it's true, form does work. Perfect instance, right? W uh, Emily Dickinson says, I'm drunk, but it's not on liquor that's real liquor. I'm drunk on the power of my imagination, and this poem will reel. That's form working. The poem gets written by a drunkard who doesn't drink real liquor, but who gets drunk, who is intoxicated by the power of her ability to move from one metaphor to the next until the whole thing explodes and she can lean against the sun. That's form working. That's form working. All right, so we're gonna go around and get final words. Uh, and so why don't we start with Emily? We'll go around the table. We'll get the three folks. You guys in the Google Hangouts, because these guys are using Apollo 10 technology, um, it's hard to hear. I'm seeing that in uh, the Facebook commentary. It's hard to hear you guys, so speak very slowly when you guys talk, okay? All right, Emily, final thoughts. Keep in mind, everybody, that week three is relatively easy. Sorry to say that. This is big ideas, theoretically complicated, but the poems are pretty straightforward. We're moving to another part of modernism next, and that's Gertrude Stein. Right? So, look, the number of people who are active in ModPo will fall if you're not careful next week as judges from Los Angeles go back to their courtrooms and figure that they can skip the Gertrude Stein. Sorry, Cliff, I know you won't. Give. No, I'm, te I'm teasing. Yeah, you're doing it. Uh, you're, you're rendering judgment, but you're reading your Stein under the table. Um, Please stay with us. Gertrude Stein is hard, but it's so much fun. It's so interesting. Gertrude Stein is so smart, and it's so unusual. This is my cheerleading for Stein. So please stay for Stein. Once you get past Stein, things are going to get very interesting. Anna, are you saying something to me? Yeah, I'm just reminding you 10 minutes. Yes. Facebook, no, we don't have that anymore. They're not limited. Right. And thank you for reminding me, though. Emily, final thoughts. 
Sure. Um, I love the comment earlier um, in the webcast about this poetry being quantum. Um, and even though I don't understand science, there's something really um, appealing about that, um, that this can exist in multiple dimensions. And also, um, yeah, the, the type of freedom of experimentation that uh, Jason was talking about, about empiricism and the fact that Pound and Williams will eventually um, not exactly discard this, but um, move on from it pretty quickly into um, new modes of inquiry and uh, new discovery. And I, I like the idea, um, I'm invested in the idea that poetry, all kinds of writing, the work uh, it does is as urgent for um, knowledge uh, as any other kind of work um, in the sciences or the humanities. Fantastic, thank you. Davey, final thoughts, final words? Now I'm trying to speak slowly. Uh, something I was also thinking about with that first question about the quantum features of poetry is uh, how important uh, the rise and proliferation of city planning is to Williams, and just to remember that the first municipal city planning department is in is in Hartford in um, 1907, and these poems are being written at the moment that uh, the idea of how do we make a city a city, how do we do municipal work to systematize things, um, how do we do larger scientific work to think about how systems operate is a question that people are asking and this is a real moment of asking big meta questions about what are systems, how do they work, mm -hmm. and that this is work that's really responding to that, that we take yeah. for granted that there are big municipal systems that we can participate in, but just like, the, the question that's driving everyone crazy in this moment is how do we make a frame, what kind of work can a frame, what kind of work can form do, and that these poems are participating in a larger moment of that. Yeah, S people who live in cities and artists who live in cities are constantly thinking about form, and the city itself is a form. And so th what I'm about to say is no slight against the country, no slight against non-city life at all. But if you took, uh, if you created a curriculum that's not like uh, Modpo, a curriculum that's more interested in content, more interested in lyricism, more interested in character and narrative, right, you're gonna be less in the city. But this kind of poetry from the m early modernists, well, Whitman and Dickinson, but Whitman in particular, but early modernists, these people, up through the New York School and the Beats, it's about the city. So that's, th there's something really important going on there. Lily, final words for today's webcast. Oh yeah, I just want to use my final words as a plug for office hours. Um, I think all the TAs are experiencing some low traffic in our office hours, myself included, and we want to talk to you guys. So um, come to office hours. Like I really just love talking about the poems. So like even if you don't have a question, but you're just like, my favorite word in, this po in all the poetry we read this week was pantomime. And I wanted to just talk about that word. I'd be like, Great use of office hours. In, in the 13 ways. <laughs> yeah, and, and use that as an example since it's right in front of me. But um, yeah, just come and talk because uh, we're excited about like taking the time in the forums to like try and more or less have a live chat. There's no yeah. actual live chat function, but we're there refreshing the Virtually feed. Virtually live, yeah. Yeah, so we're, so we're excited to talk to you and we want you to come to office hours. Yes, please. Office hours are fantastic. It's a very unique part of Modpo. Dave Poplar, final word. Speak slowly, please. Uh, this is just an interesting observation. Earlier today, I was in a fellow philosophy grad student's office and looking around and looking at his library books, and the book on top was Tender Buttons. Really? Yep. <laughs> in philosophy. This is a philosophy person. Yep. That's Gertrude Stein, folks. <laughs> Gertrude Stein has entered philosophy. She, she entered philosophy. Philosophy caught up with her. Thank you, Dave. Good to see you. I'm Maurice Kuchansky. Final thoughts? Um, I guess I'll just comment on the value of rereading and um, reading what some people have said that um, just the same way you can come back and think about relationships differently with people, with words, um, you can come back to these poems every year with something different. And so that applies to the study as well. If you find yourself frustrated or you're not alone and maybe give it a day maybe give it a year and come back to the poems and they'll offer you something great good cheerleading there thank you Omris and, and it's great to see you Allie Castleman in New York final thoughts yeah I'm still kind of hung up on what Mandana brought up about um, the, how touching it is listening to um, Williams reading his poem through time um, and di different iterations of the same poem uh, and especially it points to in a way that seems really instructive just in our syllabus 
um, the kind of futility of the images trying to create this movement of static, um, which though the poems can remain that way, the audience separate from one person um, coming, looking at a poem at different, at different times of their individual life, just time receding from that poem and that moment and that movement yeah. um, inevitably changes it and kind of uh, agitates that static, that stillness. Yeah, that's beautifully put. Thank you, Allie, and it's great to see you tonight. Thank you so much. You. Uh, so Jason, final thoughts, and then Anna? Yeah, I was just thinking about um, how first, the closer you look at an image's poem, the more language you see. Um, as my tweet for the night, but. <laughs> um, Say that, that again. That the closer you look at an imagist poem, the more language you see. I think the closer you look, if you, like taking Davies, uh, the, just bringing up fractals, the, it, like if you put a microscope on an imagist poem, you'll find Gertrude Stein. Um, but also, if you're having, if you're just kind of, especially when we go into Gertrude Stein, and if you find yourself utterly baffled, um, one thing to do is to go back to the 13 ways of looking at a blackbird and substitute the word poem for blackbird mm -hmm. and see um, if that provides any instruction. Wow, that's a great suggestion, thank you. Yes, 13 ways of looking at a poem. And each of the tender buttons is one of those blackbirds, great. And Anna will stop smiling because she always she's always blown away by what Jason says. And now Anna, final thoughts. Literally always. Oh my God, that was yeah. so good. Um, I guess I just I just want to um, echo what Lily said about office hours and just um, really encourage people to come and hang out with us because um, we love you and we and we want to meet you. Um, and I guess I would also like to um, cheerlead a little bit for next week because I know that. Um, Stein and the modernist, ex you know, the, the modernism at extremes can be an off-putting and scary week. Um, you know, we're f all feeling very open-minded about imagism and early modernism right now, but <laughs> it can all go very downhill very fast when we get into the tender buttons. Um, but I think it's a really, really exciting week. I think it's a week where we get to see the limits of what, the limits and also the possibilities of what language can do. Um, and to me, there's. Um, kind of no project more uniquely suited to meet that challenge than ModPo. Um, so stick with us, um, stick, stick with us and stick with it. And um, I'm really excited. I'm really looking forward to talking about it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. I, I just want to shout out to three people by way of conclusion tonight. Uh, Eileen Kazura uh, is uh, her first time in ModPo. Uh, she's from Anchorage, Alaska, uh, where, she, where, as she says, we're quickly losing daylight. Uh, a natural time to spend time with poetry. She's been listening to Poem Talk for years, which is the alternative curriculum 30-minute uh, podcast that's been going on since 2007 that I host happily. And she spent time with every episode, and she names one in particular. So she came from Poem Talk to Mod Po in, Ala in Anchorage, and we're glad you're here, Eileen. Um, the second of the three I want to shout out to is James Piccarello. Uh, Jim, he says he's coming late to the party, took a few courses as an undergrad in the 1970s, including one on modern poetry. But modern poetry, he says, was different in the 70s. I'm not sure what he means because he doesn't explain it, but he goes on to say that he grew up in Brooklyn, and since his career was in computer science at Bell Labs, he spent the last 30 years living in New Jersey. He still has some family in Brooklyn, so he's straddled the urban, suburban worlds. He likes poetry and philosophy the way a lot of folks read mystery and sci-fi novels. But having a day job, he's more of a grazer than a systematic reader. Um, one of the benefits, he said, of living in New Jersey was that in 1981, he was looking for a pediatrician for his daughter, and the name he got was Williams. William Eric Williams, that's one of Bill's sons, who uh, carried on the pedi pediatric practice, uh, William Eric Williams. So, he says, I got to visit the, his dad's house 
because William Eric Williams actually operated the uh, the little clinic in the old house in Rutherford. So I got to visit his dad's house and have a few very brief exchanges with W.E.W. -W on W.C.W. So, Jim, we're glad you're with us, and uh, hello to New Jersey. Uh, Kathy D., finally. Hello, Mod Poer, she says. It's so great to be back with many poetry lovers. This is my second time taking Mod po, so I plan to quickly review the main content and then concentrate on Mod po Plus. Yes, Mod po shows what a MOOC downright can be. The only thing more amazing than the content is the knowledge that even though you and I, or I are just one of thousands, tens of thousands taking the course, if you ask a question, make a comment, or just want to talk poetry, someone from ModPo is really there. I mean, wow. Thank you, Kathy, for saying that. Thank you so much. Cliff, Mandana, Adelaide, Emily, Danny, Ma uh, Magdalena, Bob, Chris, and who did I miss who called others? And Joyce Pope, so glad you called. Um, there have been so many tweets tonight about how awesome Chris and Zach are, especially because I lowered expectations about the <laughs> primitive equipment that they were using. Um, so you guys are awesome, and a whole lot of people, T, Ray Maxwell, there's a whole lot of people who are saying hello to you guys. And I want to thank you, too, in advance for making the trip all the way to California to run this webcast from there next week. Um, Anna, Jason, Lily, Davey, Emily, Allie, Amaris, and Dave, thank you all so much, not just for tonight, but for sticking with this crazy project for five years. It's so much fun. And thank, for all, thank you to all the regulars and all the rookies. We're so glad everybody came together. This is the weirdest webcast we've done in a long time. But I bet we will watch it again and again because of how weird it was. Go eat your meatballs. I'm going to go watch a baseball game. And we will see you from Silicon Valley, the home of something. Ground zero of something. I think Writer's House is ground zero of MOOCs, but whatever, that's another story. Good night, everybody, and we'll see you soon.